we're back with Ed, and uh, we're getting to do the part that I like the best, and that's t take a look at and talk about prints. And we've talked about the gear, we've talked about thinking about the shot, planning the shot, capturing the shot, but in the end, um, it's about the print, and it's more about the print for Ed's kind of photography than just about anybody else's kind of photography that I know because this is not something you look at far away. You've got to come up here and you've got to explore this image. So Ed, tell us a little bit about that. I mean, it's just, I'm looking at the detail. I'm looking, every little square I can draw has a story. Yeah, well for me, um, you know, everything, like if I go and start looking for the best lenses to acquire the image, you know, the best system, what do I capture it with? It used to be 4x5 and 8x10 film. Now I'm using a 60 megapixel Hasselblad. I'm about to go to 100 megapixel. So I'm, I'm looking at the best quality all along the way and then also looking at the best quality output. How do I get the output to work? And way back when, I, I even handpicked my, you know, 8x10 lenses for, for the enlarger. I handpicked my 4x5 lenses. So everything was kind of done. But it's all in service of making a fantastic print because for me, this is where the viewer gets to engage with the work that I do. And I've always played to what I believe is one of photography's great strengths, which is that it can articulate our world in such excruciating detail that you can go in there and dig in, and I call it the six inch test. So you can stand back, take a look at it, but you can dig in and be six inches away and you can still see everything, every person, everything on the porches, every boat, what's on the boat. You know, and there's probably like a thousand people or more. If I had somebody count every person, there may be several thousand people here. But in a way, you can go and explore this whole scene and it tells a story. It's a kind of in one image, there's a complete narrative and you can spend time with it. You can spend, I, I, you know, I learn things about, I find things in these pictures all the time. There's no way I can see this when I'm up in a helicopter. Not viewfinder, I'm, no. I'm looking through uh, the viewfinder and I'm putting the shape. I'm looking at the composition. I'm looking at the edges. I'm looking at what, what distance do I want to be? What do I want to include? How are the corners working? You know, and all of those kinds of questions. But when I actually see the print is when I discover what's in it because there's no way I could see that when I'm there you know, shooting down from a helicopter at 800 feet. This is like such a strong print. When you talk about, you know, seeing in the composition, just, you know, the, from the winding to the narrowing of the river, the direction of the logs, the direction of the homes, and it just circles you all the way back. And no matter which way you look at it, either far away or close, your eye continually moves to something new and different. You know, I'm watching over here where, as you say, this is where logs come in, they go into the mill and they come out uh, where they're sold. But uh, this must be part of the village street. And you can see dogs and people and couples. And I mean, it's just, there's so much here. Yeah, and it's amazing that you see the whole process from these logs where they roll up, they spend some time on the, uh, on the shore drying, and then they put them into these big sawmills. And because it's very short on electricity in this area, that they only run the sawmills for about three or four hours, and then the power's cut. So for three or four hours, it's zing, zing, and they're zinging all these boards, and then creating almost like a two-by-four type of uh, lumber, which is then purchased here and taken away. Uh, and then to use to build these these homes in, 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 well, on the water. I see. I see. You know, they'll be looking at this. And then you start thinking. I see no cranes, no conveyors. It looks like this all must be done manually. There doesn't look like there's any mechanical devices pushing these boards, and you know, there's no cranes or anything moving this stuff. Even down here, this you got guys in canoes pushing these things. Yeah. Well, there's nothing other than canoes, and the most advanced thing in here at all. Is, is the saw blade. So that's the, the number one thing that is technological advancement is the blade that cuts the boards. Everything else is pretty much manual. So, you know, you're predicting to go to a print. What, what size is this out of curiosity? This is uh, 48 inches mm -hmm. by 64 inches. Mm -hmm. Cool. Now, we have another print we want to look at, and we're going to put it up here. And it's one that uh, we've talked about. And it's of uh, the one of the well pictures. So yep. let's let's take this down. We'll put the well picture up. And um, I spent a lot of time over the last few weeks uh, knowing I was going to get the opportunity to work with Ed. One of the images that caught me was this Eicher-like image. And 
Uh, over lunch I was talking about it and I just found not only was the structure amazing, but the story behind it and what it really is and the whole geometry and uh, also how it was shot. So I'm going to let Ed take it from here and explain what we're looking at, where it is, and just to kind of <laughs> see something like this. Number one, in reality, it must have been really something to see, but how you managed to put this together and what it represents is a, a story in itself. Well, these are uh, step wells that were built uh, in the province of Rajasthan, uh, a, a desert province, northern India. And this was, they started building these in the 12th century. And this is how they would um, be able to supply water to the, to the villages and towns. So they would dig these deep pits that would actually, at the dry season, at the driest period, uh, you'd have the water table way down low. And so they would dig it, and then, I still don't even understand in the 12th century how they managed to dig it and keep the water out and start building a structure that still survives to today, but they did. And, and then they'd start building from the bottom up these step wells, and they were called step wells. And so as the monsoons would come, the, the water would fill, and people would come and gather water at that level. And as it got drier and drier through the summer and, uh, and beyond, it would, the water table would go down, and they would continue to follow the steps down to get the water. And then it, the cycle would repeat itself every year. So there were about 350 of these that still exist. And I went out in search of some of the most interesting ones that still remain, that are, that are held together, that have wonderful color and scale to them. I and mean, I wanted to do something different, so I wanted to get above them and looking down onto them. So even before I went, we had uh, drawings and dimensions of them, and we were able to actually figure out what lens would work with these uh, before we went. And then we also brought with us a pneumatic pole that we could pump up about up to 50 feet, and on top, uh, remote head that I could put the Hasselblad with fiber optics going down to my computer and that I, with remote, I could then control the composition with the remote and then do the focus and the shooting. It worked fantastically. Not to say it was, w wasn't without headaches because sometimes the, you know, I'd get interference in the radio frequencies and the head would start doing its own thing. And it was all about getting the right light because there was very rarely any cloud in the sky and I didn't want full sun on these so it, it had to work with the time of day very early morning I'd often start setting up when it was dark to be ready for when the first light started coming in. I'm just trying to imagine what it must be like for somebody to actually at the worst time of the year just to get their water having to go down so many flights of steps get the water and then come back up and what I see now there's nothing down here. It's all garbage and trash and so forth. I mean, what, what's happened to the water levels? Do they still work? Well, what happened is uh, in this town called Bundi, uh, they've gone to more modern techniques of getting their water. So they drill wells and then they're pumping it up uh, with water pumps. Uh, and then what's happened is that the town's grown and now they're pumping below the water table of what this needed to function. So now it never hadn't seen water for over uh, a decade at this point. And what's happening now is that it's just filling with garbage. And the interesting thing is just before I shot this, the day before I came, it was a sunny day, and, uh, and there was garbage everywhere. Every step had garbage on it. So it was like a, a dump site. And I had to pay the, the town to, because this was considered one of their you know, featured architectural sites in the city. And the guy who uh, I had to pay was beside me, and I said, do you want me to make a picture of this site with all this garbage on it and then take it around the world? And he went, oh, no, that's a bad idea. So that night, they had, like, there were 40, 40 workers here sweeping all the steps, and it all got swept down there. Yeah, they missed uh, a spot or two. They missed a spot or two. <laughs> or there's new things yeah, accumulated in the meantime. And so the next day, I got there, uh, and it was pretty clear of all the debris. What, what do you think the depth of this is for perspective? It's like 100 and something feet deep. Yeah, so there's, the, the other, there's one below here that's actually one of the biggest ever built and still preserved quite beautifully. Yeah, so this is one of the biggest step wells that still is preserved. But you can imagine the labor it took at that time to be able to build these literally all, all by hand. You know, there was no machinery at the time. But why, you know, there's multiple stairways going into this and, you know, just, I, I can imagine at one point there'd be hundreds and hundreds of people. 
Sure, in the service in the, the whole town. That's why you have to have all these multiple entry points. It was quite a, uh, a kind of ingenious architectural response to living in the desert and to be able to survive through the dry seasons through a well uh, uh, of this nature. I think uh, the magnitude of designing something like this and you know measuring and putting together and engineering, you know, back as you say, this was what 12th century. Yes. I mean, that's all those hundreds of years ago to be able to accomplish this and still stand. Yeah, you know, over 800 years ago. I keep thinking, what are we building today that we expect to be around in 800 years? So it is quite a, a marvel to have these things still survive time and still be uh, there to see. And, and again, this one's gone defunct too yeah, because there's no water. There, there's no it's, water. it's all it's all gone below the table. So, so yeah, these things have um, are no longer useful, but they they stand as a testament to human ingenuity and. And surviving in a desert. If somebody wanted to see more of these, this is in from your water project. Yes, it is. So it's in the your yeah. book called the Water Project, yeah. and we'll put links in the uh, story about that. All your images have something incredible going for them, but just the the patterns, you know, it defies composition. And you know, we were talking a little bit about this too, that you know we're so trained as photographers, you know, the golden rules and the thirds and so forth, but there there isn't any of that here. I mean, you're you're playing with patterns and strengths and... Yeah, and I the, like the flattening yeah. of space. I love that, the all-overness, uh, when you get this, where every square inch, like a painter, everything's okay. considered. The whole surface, uh, like a canvas, is considered. And I'm yeah. looking at the whole print surface as a considered surface. Mm -hmm. And in this case, I mean, we had the camera at the full 50-foot extension. I had uh, four people on tethered ropes to the very top of the 50 inch, and once I got the positioning of the 50 foot pole above it, tilt it over it, and then I had to tie off the camera, steady the whole camera. I had, like I said, the 100 foot of uh, fiber optic to my computer, and then I'm running the head, and then going to my computer and looking uh, at making sure the focus was good. And I was using autofocus, and then I could zoom in and see it as I'm you, shooting you've it. You've got depth of field concerns and other things yeah. here too, so. What an accomplishment. How many of these did you uh, photograph? Well, I did uh, about uh, uh, eight of them. Wow. So here's something else I want to show you, Kevin. Um, I've been working on a project uh, in the world of 3D. Uh, so about a year ago, I was in Kenya, and they were doing a burning of tusks that had been poached as a signal to poachers to, that this is what's going to happen to these uh, ivory tusks that are, have been captured. And that's really to send a signal, but also to take them off the market. Because once you know, they're, 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 they have them in storage, those storage facilities are under attack all the time as well, because this has a lot of value. Um, so this was a pile that's about 20 feet high by 20 by 20. I shot it with conventional Hasselblad, and I shot it all, uh, you know, all the ways I would normally shoot it. But I also decided to take something that I find really fascinating, which is that I've always worked with, again, the three-dimensional world and flattened it to a two-dimensional picture. Right. But now with that same flattening device with digital, I'm able to take multiple pictures, put them through software, and the software will, will restitch it together and find all the contours and all the spaces and rebuild that object in the third dimension just using a regular camera. So I'm actually starting to play with uh, the idea of the next generation of photography, or I call it photography 3.0. Thinking of photography 1.0 is, uh, you know, ke chemistry and all the enlargers and all that stuff that was the history of photography. Then the second one is digital, and now this is a third dimension. I, I have to say this is just giving me a pause because you know once again it's an immersive kind of thing I mean I look at this and say wow first off you know what it represents for the animals that had to give up these these tusks but secondly the fact that I can now go around it and yeah just and you the, look at it you can see you know you, you sit and you I want to immerse myself just big tusk little tusk you can see through the edges of you know smaller ones and you know, what's underneath? I mean, this is remarkable. Oh. This, the, these are about uh, eight feet high, just to give oh. you perspective. So this would be 20 by? 20 foot high, yeah. Wow. 
yeah. and they just light this on fire and it goes away. So well, it's not to light it on fire. This is like burning your teeth. It's enamel. So they have to use diesel. So they use a uh, uh, truck and truck out of diesel. To, there was 11 piles this scale uh, that, that, that they burned. It was uh, over $150 million worth of ivory on the market, and it was the tusks of 11,000 elephants. Incredible. So, so this is gone. It burnt the next day. Gone for all time, but now n not only can I print it, but now you can experience this in an AR experience, aug augmented reality, or a VR experience, and you can walk around it at scale. So you can actually walk around this pile today and really feel for what it was and what it means. And to me, it's another way of leaving a very powerful record of you know, humans Im human impact on nature in a whole other way. So do you. you Obviously, you're spending a lot of time. I think you have a company that is doing this now, but this, this, this is where you see a new aspect of uh, photography going. I do. Well, photogrammetry is really uh, uh, another extension. So as photographers, I think, have moved into video because, of course, the tools, you know, now you can use an SLR and you can use a Canon and now you can use it as a video camera. And I know Hasselblad's just put in a 4K system in the video as well on the new 100. So, so all of a sudden these cameras can be video cameras, but now that same camera, you can go and shoot a variety of, of uh, points of view on uh, an object and then have it recreated in the third dimension. And as you know, more and more VR and AR applications start to come into the marketplace, um, that'll be another um, kind of, it's already in the photographer's toolkit. Uh, if you have, a, if you have, even with an iPhone, you can do this. Of course, you know, it won't be as good a resolution, no. but, but there is uh, this capacity now to begin to think of capturing the world in the third dimension. I can't wait to see what you do with this. This is, you know, <laughs> this is so totally different. Wow. Yeah. yeah. yeah it's fine. Yay for you for taking in another step. It's nice to see that uh, you're, yeah. you're doing that, and I can't wait to see where this all goes. Hopefully we can come back and even do something more on that one. All right. Okay. Good. Thanks. Thanks. When we started, we talked about the fact that this was not a studio, and one of the things that I was impressed on when I came here is that Ed has a massive inventory of his work. And what's more impressive than anything else is his work is cataloged and inventoried to the hilt. So we're in one of Ed's two print storage rooms. Um, whether you call it this or not, I'm going to call this the horizontal storage room because most of the prints are mm -hmm. stored horizontally. And the uh, room next to us is kind of a, a vertical storage room, with more for a different purpose for where those prints are heading and so forth. And you can see on the wall here um, a lot of book storage from your, your numerous books and so forth. But um, you can see that underneath um, every one of these boards and as far as this goes is all the prints. And you, you sign these prints right away, don't you? So. Well, I do sign them. Uh, I initial them on the sides of the borders because they will be eventually mounted. Collectors like to know that it was mm -hmm. printed in, in my time. Yep. So I, when I sign it, it says, I was here, I signed it. Uh, and even though the signature may be cut away, it's, to, still, to mount, signed. it's still signed. So you, we, it's, it's proof that it was done uh, in my time. And that's the big question. Do you, do you sign the mat when you, when, you, when you put the mat on, say, going into uh, a museum situation or a customer? Do you sign the print or do you sign the no, mat? What happens is all of these have been checked to see if they're actually saleable prints, that okay. they don't have kinks that aren't uh, that won't come out, that they're proper color, density, sharpness, all of that stuff. Once they're there, they're cataloged, they're on a database. But I also have uh, labels. So when it's mounted to die bond, I have signed labels with each one of these, the name and the title and all that, that can be attached to the back of the die bond. And then it completes the print at that point. Ah, that's remarkable. So all this is prints. This is more books. You also have this storage cabinet. And, and this has a number of uh, photographs that you've uh, done print exchanges with other photographers. Yeah, so oftentimes, a lot of photographers will come here and work. Uh, through my lab, and I'll love what they're doing, and I'll say, do you want to trade? We'll do that. Or sometimes I see an artist's work out there in the world, and I say, hey, would you want to trade with one of my mm -hmm. prints? And so I've actually ended up having quite a few prints that I've traded with different artists, and, you know, just kind of had collected, collected them here. So I have some here and some in other. You know, this is a Volker setting. He did a whole series on, on pictures in zoos, oh. uh, et, cetera, et cetera. So I've often 
sometimes I buy a print at auction too, and, and so I, I do trade with artists. I think I have about 300 pieces now, but really? I'm slowly building a, my own collection of things that I like. And uh, a lot of it's photography, sometimes it's painting, but things that I find inspiring and, and, uh, and kind of things that I'd like to do in exchange. And most artists, when I ask them, go, sure, I'd love to. And you've told me your home is full of art. Now, how many pieces of art that you have you said to me? Uh, something. I, yeah, uh, well, I have, well, I have about probably 60 hanging up in my home in, in Toronto and about another 30 or 40 in my oh, country that's home. That's so cool to see. Yeah. Now, you can see maybe just here real quickly, there's a series of tabs where the image is there, and of course on the other side is the, the data, so uh, it's pretty interesting the way you've got all these cataloged, and in the other room you've got the, uh, the vertical storage, so it's all inspiring not only to see the photography, but to see what it takes to keep this business moving, and um, you know, I kind of want to thank you right now uh, before we close out, but the people you have working for you have been so cooperative today and you know, I know they work hard and uh, they've got a passion with everything and the way they explained how it's all taken care of so um, yeah, really, well, really remarkable. It takes a team now to do what I do. I couldn't do it by myself mm -hmm. and so it is that kind of fortune, fortunate thing that I've been able to find a way to get my work into the world that a market started to go around large color prints and it allowed me to kind of work in bigger and more interesting ways and because I have dealers around the world, I have a dealer in, in Singapore and Hong Kong and Berlin and London and New York uh, uh, and Toronto. So I have to manage all of these different relationships and they all have, want to know where all the work is, so I have to keep it all kind of organized. <laughs> do you sleep? <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> do you mind if we take a quick look at your lab? Sure. Yeah, thanks. sure so. All right. We're here in the Ed's lab right now. now We've had the great opportunity to spend the day with Ed. We've seen a lot of different things. We've talked about a lot of different things. But, you know, the end process is all done in the color lab. And it's fun to come back here. We came back to this color lab, and the first thing I had, like, was some mental re recollection as I took a breath of air and know that you still have chemical processing equipment here. C41. Oh, you know, it's like, oh, yeah. wow. So uh, tell us a little bit about here. We're, we're obviously in the production area here and over... Uh, there we've got uh, processors and uh, other d different things. You kind of a combination of a digital and hybrid solution here. So remarkable space here. And the fact that you got your own lab and can do your own work, I'm so impressed. So give us a little bit of the history. Well, it was around 1983. I graduated in 82 uh, from Ryerson. I used to be able to do my own color printing there. Um, and then I went and set up my own drum processor at home with a, with a bezeler and large color enlarger. And... And I was working and trying to get consistent edition prints, and I had a really hard time doing that. And all my friends who were trying to be artists at the same time were really struggling to try and get really good consistent prints. Mm -hmm. And um, so in 83, I started thinking, you know, I think Toronto's big enough to have uh, a darkroom rental where serious amateurs and professional photographers and artists who want to work with photography can all have access to this technology. So I went out and put together a plan and, uh, and kind of designed what I thought were the best darkroom rentals that I'd seen. Because when I went on a trip in 83 uh, around North America, I found that there were rental labs in Calgary and in Seattle and San Francisco. And I went into all of them, talked to the owners, looked at their brochures, saw, printed a print, felt how it, was, how it was, and had some stuff processed to see what, what it felt like, made notes all along the way came back and designed what I felt was the best darkroom rental lab that money could buy. And then went out to find the money, and in 1985, I rented 2,000 square feet right here in this building and set up Toronto Imageworks, a, a color printing lab. And one of the reasons of doing that, if, if, if you're, you're around in the early 80s, it was a really bad recession, oh, yeah. and there was nothing going on. So I, I thought, well, you know what? Rather than be a camera for hire, I'd... I'd, I'd like to start a business where I can do my own prints to control that and then also extend it to all my colleagues who were doing it as well and turn it into a business plan, meaning that I didn't really then have to go out and make a living with a camera, that this would be my base right, salary right. and then I'd also ha have a place to make my prints. So uh, 32 years later, it's still here and doing uh, all my prints. and. And it's been quite... Uh, and you do quite, other people's uh, yeah. prints here, but the, the darkroom rentals are gone now. 
There are no darkroom rentals. Uh, yeah. boy, but you still do chemical processing, which is kind of fun and different. Yeah, and the C41 seems to be growing in this black and white, so people are going back to the conventional film. Now, your prints are printed how? To, you, I mean, we saw your prints, and people are going to say, and presume maybe, that you're using uh, inkjet to, to make a lot of your prints, but you're not. Is that right? Or? No, everything up to the 50-inch size, mm -hmm. I'm still writing with a Chromira printer. Okay. And then as soon as it goes past 50 uh, inches, we go to a Canon 60-inch printer, which is giving fantastic results. Right, and the Chromira is using, you're using a Kodak paper. Yep. Um, what is this the paper type? Is that? Um uh, it's, uh, it's the basic, the, the paper that runs through the RA4. It's a type N surface that I like to work with. Okay, so you, and, the, and the printer itself has a processor built into it. So when the, the print's made, it, it comes out the other end processed? Or yeah. do you have to take a, con a canister out and move Take a canister out and then and feed it into the processor. Okay, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Excellent. Well, very, very fascinating. You, I can't thank you enough for spending the day with us. Uh, a great lunch, great conversation about photography, great stories that you have. I really hope that we get a chance to meet again and maybe do uh, something a little bit further. I can see a number of different things we can do, especially I'd love to uh, follow you on the 3D printing that you're beginning to, to get into. But on behalf of all the, the viewers and readers of Luminous Landscape, uh, you know, thank you for Hasselblad uh, for uh, their contribution to the equipment and uh, specifically your talent and vision and the journey that you've made. You're, you're an inspiration and it's been a privilege. Well, thank, thank you, Kevin. Thank you very much. You appreciate it's it very much. You. And you, all our readers, thanks very much for hanging in there and I'll see you on the Luminous Landscape.